There is a Yu-Gi-Oh game that's mere existence defies all reason, baffles duelists in an instant with its absurd story and jarring mechanics, and maybe you have already heard of its grandeur. But did you know that inside this game, a secret was locked away for 16 years, a secret even stranger than the game itself that continues to be shrouded in mystery? I certainly didn't when starting my research on this game, which led me down a rabbit hole it seems I will never return from. So today, I'm going to tell you about the strangest Yu-Gi-Oh game ever, Duelist of the Roses, what it hid from the world, and the lengths I went through to try and solve the still lingering mysteries. Japan, September 6, 2001. Duelist of the Roses releases on PS2, the first game in the series for the still young console. During a time where the Yu Gi Oh franchise was massively popular in the country and just about to begin its takeover abroad later that month. This next gen game takes our favorite group of card game aficionados and throws them into 15th century Great Britain during the historic Wars of the Roses, a battle between the houses of York and Lancaster over control of the throne. And yes, both then and now, this is absurd. A majority of the cast is literally playing themselves in some historical role, which ends up being more comical than playing a children's card game to save yourself from a delusional clown man's dark energy discs. Okay, let me break it down for you. Yui plays the part of Henry Tudor of Lancaster, the future king. His druid, Simon, used the magical eight red rose cards to isekai the player from an unknown era here to help take down Richard III, played by the evil Haishin from the beloved PlayStation game Forbidden Memories, aided by Kaiba and the Rose Crusaders, or Christian Rosencruz, who isn't even known to be real, but rather a myth tied into a secret society called the Fraternity of the Rose Cross, which symbolically used a white rose, thus connecting Kaiba and the Crusaders to the Yorks. Kaiba is planning to summon Manawadan Fabli, Look, I tried my best. Who is the brother of the final boss of Forbidden Memories, Nightmare. Simon was actually summoned by Yugi's mom, Margaret Beaufort, who, I kid you not, is played by Mai. And sadly, for any of the shippers, Joey only ends up as Mai's priest. But at least that means Joey is not Yugi's father. However, the person Mai is married to, Thomas Stanley, is played by the mastermind behind the Duelist Kingdom arc, Maximilian Pegasus, but is luckily only Yugi's stepdad. Speaking of couples, Taya and Yugi actually do make it work as she is Elizabeth of York, Henry's future wife. Meanwhile, Tristan, Thomas Gray, is Taya's half-brother. Yugi's grandpa isn't his grandpa, but rather his uncle once removed, Jasper Tudor, which is even more confusing since Simon is generally the ancestor of grandpa and thus they never show up together, but this story can do whatever it wants, so we won't worry about that. Shadi, or John Morton, takes on the role of counselor for Yugi, which lines up fine, while Bakora claims to be Jack Cade, which little is known about, but rumors suggest he had an interest in dark arts, likely explaining the casting. And the rest of the characters, Mako, Weevil, Rex, Bones, Panic, Labyrinth Ruler, Ishtar, and Keith do not have any historical inspiration. But fun fact, Keith is wearing a Union flag in place of his USA one, which makes no sense since the Union flag won't exist for over 300 years. And as you might expect, this all leads to some of the most absurd scenes and dialogue you will ever see in a Yu-Gi-Oh game, such as Yugi disowning the Henry Tudor name for brevity, or Seto, the one who generally doesn't believe in ancient magic, being associated with Stonehenge. But you may have noticed a few nods to FM, and that's because Duels of the Roses is actually a sequel to that notoriously difficult game. The true titles for FM and Roses are Yu-Gi-Oh! True Duel Monsters Sealed Memories and Two Inherited Memories. Covering this is the best way to understand Roses and the mystery. The two games share a very similar spin-off of the physical card game, with fusions and hand refilling galore. However, Roses throws a table-sized wrench into things, using a 7x7 grid for monsters to traverse in order to attack the opponent's monsters and their deck leader. You heard that right, this game is also the first ever mention of deck leaders in Yu-Gi-Oh!, releasing six months before the anime-exclusive attempt at this in the Virtual World arc. Leaders do add some depth and more strangeness, allowing any monster you obtain to be promoted across 12 ranks, rewarding abilities such as increasing your movement. The caveat here is that the game fails to introduce these mechanics to the player well and hides both leader experience as well as the two abilities that revolve around obtaining cards. Speaking of, Roses also takes a unique spin on this in general, with its dual reward being a ridiculous slot machine that pulls from the opponent's graveyard rather than a single card drop or pack seen in all games prior. Yet Roses does share one method for obtaining cards with FM, a method that was already a staple of the series by 2001, the Passport. Now the historical aspects of Roses have nothing to do with FM. The story connections simply boil down to Kaiba summoning an evil being to follow in his ancestors' footsteps. But unique to the sequel is that Kaiba lets you decide whether to side with him or Yugi, providing two stories to play through 
although both simply consist of beating a handful of characters, the rival, and then taking down Fablier, who Kaiba summons in either case. This ends the game, resulting in Yugi being crowned king, and Kaiba disappearing, with the player definitively returning home only if they side with Kaiba. However, in each ending, there is one line of dialogue, telling of an inscription that Kaiba left for future generations. And these are, of course, used in that shared method for acquiring cards. The password. password. The password. An eight-digit number adorned to the lower left corner of just about every Yu-Gi-Oh card ever printed. These persistent IDs allow each card in the game to be uniquely identified in databases, but have otherwise offered little to the franchise at all. Aside from one particular application. In many of the numerous Yu-Gi-Oh! video games released, a password system was implemented, allowing the player to enter these fascinating codes in order to bring their collection to life or simply power up decks. Yet in all of the games, since the cards were printed, that include a standard password system, one game sticks out. Roses. Even from the get-go, things are a bit strange here, as the password system isn't in plain view as it usually is, even being a main menu option in its predecessor. Instead, passwords can only be entered by knowing to press the right stick while in deck edit. From here, we would typically enter a standard 8-digit password from our favorite card, and that card must simply not be present in the game. How about... No. You see, not only was the password mechanic itself a bit more hidden, there is something entirely different about Rose's system. Instead of using the 8-digit passwords people were familiar with, they decided to recode these passwords to a set of alphanumerical passwords unique to this game. Although this could essentially add to the game's difficulty, as it is true the password system is an incredibly powerful tool to FM and plenty of other Yu-Gi-Oh games, it leaves one big, briefcase-sized question. How do we go about obtaining these passwords? If we recall back to those inscriptions left by Kaiba, it is now clear that they are in fact a pair of passwords, likely for some incredibly powerful cards given the requirements needed to get the- Okay, so the cards aren't iconic Yu-Gi-Oh cards, and they likely wouldn't be considered the best, but they are both fine enough for a Yu-Gi-Oh game made up of 50% vanilla monsters. Now, even if a player did realize these endgame codes were passwords, or they happened to come upon the password screen and deck at it, how are they supposed to put all of this together in general? It turns out, the game's manual does have a small password section that touches on all of this, explaining both how to input passwords and that you can get passwords for beating the game. It even states very directly that physical card passwords will not work. So the whole system was clearly not intended to be entirely hidden, but rather it seems they did not want the passwords to be as abusable as they had been in other games. Fair enough. But with that said, there have to be more passwords, right? Knowing the history of the password system and that it was intended to be used, one would assume most if not all cards have a password. And if we look at exactly what the manual states about how to obtain them, passwords are obtained when you clear the game, so keep something handy to write down the passwords. Well it sounds like we just have to beat the story again to gain more. Except there is no way to do this. Once completing a side of the story and getting its password, you then take on the opposite side and at the end, gain that sides, seeming to be set as Earthshaker and Fairy's Gift like we've seen. After this, the game is essentially just free mode, with the ability to duel, build your collection, and rank up leaders. Okay, so we don't yet know how the game intends for us to find passwords, but even upon release back in February 2003, discussion of the game was alive and well online. Message boards on sites like IGN and Neoseeker were all active gaming forums, and you can bet that Yu-Gi-Oh! and Roses were discussed. That last site, Neoseeker, was particularly active in this regard, having started their dedicated forum to the game five months before the release. However, their first discussion around passwords started on February 19th, but this thread wasn't fully about roses, but rather forbidden memories. Now, FM did operate with a standard password system, as noted before, but it had one extra mechanic to tie into the sequel that we didn't touch on, but it's something you will all be familiar with, the endgame password. Upon completing the game, the player is shown one of five eight-digit numerical passwords, each of which being useless in FM. However, if entered into Roses, they in fact correspond to five cards, Exodia the Forbidden One, Meteor Dragon, Goblin Fan, Slate Warrior, and Mirror Wall. Interestingly, three of these cards were in FM using their true-to-card passwords, but the other two were not even in the game nor physically released yet, Mirror Wall coming out ten months later and Slate Warrior releasing with Roses in Japan. This, on top of the fact that the passwords are not alphanumerical like the others we have seen in Roses thus far, suggests that the developers did not know how exactly they would even be used, and certainly not for which cards. One could even assume that these placeholders are the first sign of Roses' password changes, but that can't be known for certain. These suspicious rewards certainly would have been a bit confusing to players beating FM in Japan with almost two years to wait before the sequel even released. 
but it turns out we know how this was discovered, and it comes from Konami's official Japanese site for the game. Here, not only was it revealed that the five codes from FM were used as passwords in Roses, but as post-release promotions, sets of passwords were regularly added to the site until January 4th, 2002, sharing an additional 23 passwords. So we have a total of only 30 passwords, one from playing through each in-game campaign, five from the end of FM, and 23 revealed promotionally on the official Japanese site. And that's it. That's all anyone had on these passwords. Konami themselves never seemed to release any sort of list, and there didn't appear to be any more information. The secret sat unanswered. People seemed to lose interest. Until 16 years after the game's release, one mad scientist started a project. Let me introduce you to Generic Mad Scientist, or GMS, a speedrunner with an interest in many Yu-Gi-Oh games, in particular the Yu-Gi-Oh Power of Chaos series on the PC, which they hold many world records for, FM, and of course Duelist of the Roses. GMS is well known for the work they have put into understanding mechanics of each of these games, but in 2017 particularly, they uncovered the set of passwords from within Roses itself. Up until now, no one had thought to do this, or at least shared it with the community at large, likely not helped by how small the community was, with interest in the game paling in comparison to things like FM. And thus, when GMS uncovered this game's secrets, immediately there was renewed interest in the title overall, which led to a reinvention of how it could be played, in particular for speedrunning, thus far generating 26 minutes of time save, even breaking the sub 1 hour mark using password based deck strategies. But regarding the passwords specifically, what did this reveal exactly? Aside from learning the entire list itself, it was discovered that 120 cards do not have working passwords, some of which make sense, being fusion or ritual monsters, while others make no sense at all. We even learned exactly which methods each card could be obtained through. Yet despite this finally revealing the hidden passwords and practically creating a community for the otherwise dead but remembered game, there still weren't any answers to why this all happened. Why is this the only game that mixed things up in such an extreme way, but left no ability for players to access the passwords? At that point, why were they included at all? In fact, one of the first questions I had when looking into this was about Rose's endgame passwords. Those two singular codes. They couldn't possibly be static then, right? Maybe there was some way to get a different code that we all didn't realize. No, even this theory was debunked from the 2017 information, with the passwords being hard-coded into the dialogue never to vary like the five at the end of FM. But remember the original collection of 30 passwords? That sacred list used in essentially every reference to the game for 16 years. What if I told you there were actually four more than that? Four more passwords that were noted on the Neo Seeker thread as early as three days after it was started. The passwords for Change of Heart, Gravity Bind, Royal Decree, and Crush Card. All incredibly iconic cards in the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise, having seen both high usage in competitive play and appearances in the anime and manga. The passwords for these four cards were clearly known based on these posts, and yet it didn't appear to shock anyone. Then again, why should it have? The password system was always meant to be accessible. All of these cards had passwords in other games just like the rest, and so it must have seemed normal to share this information, expected even. But then where did these four come from? Well, there is another reason I avoided mentioning these cards, as the four are part of a small set of cards, 15 in total, that can only be obtained through the password system. The other 11 were also within the original known list. The two roses and four of the FM endgame passwords, missing Meteor Dragon tentatively due to its need for fusion, plus five select passwords from the Japanese site. This already suggests two obvious origins for those missing four. The first would be the Japanese website. This theory seems to be unlikely, since both analysis of every page and Google translations don't seem to apply anything else of this sort on any archive version of the site. The second immediate thought would be another endgame reward or something similar. However, this too seems impossible, as from my research, there is no other Yu-Gi-Oh game prior to Roses with such a mechanic, nor any alphanumeric passwords like the ones we are looking for in these four cards. So let's take another look at the posts. The first mention of any of the four passwords actually only included three of them, Crush Card, Gravity Bind, and Decree. While the second had three as well, but included the missing one for Change of Heart. This could imply that they use separate resources, which may point towards other online discussions, but I had already exhausted any leads in this way, searching any mentions of the game I could find. 
The furthest back English details of passwords I could find was held on an ancient yet still kicking cheat code central, where the writer Kevin Payton, aka Shingoku EX, hosted their own guide for the game as early as April 19, 2002, which referenced the Japanese website and its passwords, which is where I learned of the site myself, but did not contain anything on the others. I have dug through any possible leads regarding Japanese forums that the post may have been referencing, the best of which was only archived back to 2007, and sadly had no indication of posting dates from what I could tell. Overall, it seems likely that the Neoseeker posts were referencing other threads, but they are at this point lost to the sands of time, or unarchived web domains. But. There must have been some official distribution of these four passwords even if the posts were not using it. There is little to no chance that four alphanumeric passwords, let alone any, were guessed at random, yet Konami would certainly have reason to believe distributing passwords for four iconic cards would be a smart move. And if the official distribution for these four cards could be tracked down, maybe it could shed more light on why the rest of the passwords were never released. So I started my investigation. First off, the only promotional trailers I could find contain nothing of the sort. And yes, I even checked if the codes in the intro cutscene revealed anything, and they didn't. But what about physical media in Japan? In fact, the English game manual explained the password system, so it seems feasible to check. And thankfully, there are some beautiful scans of the manual online. Or at least the first 21 of 46 pages. Yet the manuals do appear similar, and the English version covers passwords earlier in the build deck screen section anyways. Yet there somehow doesn't appear to be any password info at all in what we have on the book. Now, most of the missing section appears to be on dueling, and although it doesn't seem likely that it would be in the duel section, the final heading in the book is for advice. If the English section is anything to go by, then there's nothing about the passwords. Simply four green boxes with admittedly useful information about the game, but it could be different. It could contain four boxes with information on the four missing cards, yet the scans simply don't exist. And so, out of options, I activated my trap card, my credit card that is, hopping on eBay and purchasing an original Japanese copy with the manual intact. And a few days later, I received my game, a beautiful 2001 card battling video game from Japan based in 15th century UK shipped from Atlanta, Georgia. Inside, we find this beautiful Karibo and in-game art not found in the English manual. But that's really it. From what I could tell, the Japanese manual didn't mention the password system at all, and the final page was the exact same advice, leaving us at another dead end. But there is one more physical release from Konami, released only a few days after the game. An official guidebook. And as you might have guessed, there doesn't appear to be any scans online. However, many listings for it do share a great amount of detail. One in particular shows a variety of game information ranging from decklists to full map previews for each duel. We also see that the guide includes a card almanac, yet there doesn't appear to be any passwords, which we would of course expect. But the four cards could easily still be mentioned elsewhere in the book, maybe trying to promote the guide with some iconic cards. So... I reached out to the seller, JRG, with a ridiculous inquiry asking if they could help find anything relating to the passwords of the four cards. And one hour later, they got back to me. Then, the next day, four images were sent my way. Sadly, JRG only found the four cards in the almanac. But then I noticed something I had missed. There is a section mentioning how to obtain each card. And why are two of these blank while the others are struck through? With this, the lingering potential of the book's password info and how much JRG helped out, I knew I had to make one more purchase. The next day, the package was on its way, this time actually coming from Japan. And a couple weeks later, the book arrived. And what I found inside after all this searching was truly magical. This 248 page monster started off similar to our own journey, detailing the connections to FM. Going further, a very detailed guide of just about all the mechanics is found, along with many high res and larger renders of the cast than what we see in game. And eventually, we find where Konami intended players to learn of the password system, with a section detailing those from both Rose's and FM's endgame, but hiding even these passwords that would have been accessible back then. Following this is a section on the methods for obtaining cards, with a bit more info, including how to enter passwords, one additional preview of the FM rewards, and finally, that the physical OCG card passwords would not work, likely being the first time players would ever learn of what started this whole mess. All that left us with was the card almanac, 
which we already know does not contain the four passwords or any for that matter. However, we still have the acquisition method. And it turns out that every single password only card or card without a password contains the strike through, likely to represent the hidden nature of these cards. All except for the blanks we saw in Decree and Gravity Bind, which is strange but really doesn't tell us anything. Oh yeah, except Crab Turtle has the blank misprint too, which likely implies this means absolutely nothing. But there is one last lead I had. The good old Shonen Jump magazine. These books were full of promotions and info for upcoming media of the various Jump properties. There's even an example of the passwords from the first Yu-Gi-Oh game ever being fully revealed in Jump 99 issue 9. However, neither the Japanese nor English copies are archived and thus not readily accessible for this kind of research. But, the first English release of Jump was actually in January of 03, just over a month before the game's English release. And this issue is quite pricey. However, I was able to track down a YouTuber, Andre Shelf, who has a great retrospective on English Jump, which includes some peeks into that first magazine, but nothing pertaining to Yu-Gi-Oh. So I reached out to them, and a day later, they got back to me with some great information. First, the January issue did contain a two-page spread of upcoming Yu-Gi-Oh video games, with a small blurb on Roses, sadly only containing some screenshots of the soon-to-be-released game. And second, there was a full-page advertisement for the game in the April issue. But that was everything from the January to April issues. And despite being some fantastic material for anyone interested in these games or early Yu-Gi-Oh! in general, it does seem to close this lead. However, what Andre shared motivated me to keep searching for the original Japanese magazines. I started by focusing on finding anything from the 2001 volume, and one in particular seemed to overtake the results. The combination issue 3637 seems to be highly collectible due to containing both the first ever chapter of Bleach, as well as a brand new card, Embodiment of Apophis. Luckily for us, it was dated just two weeks before Roses would release. And while one listing I found contained many page previews, I knew it was highly unlikely to have what we were looking for. In fact, when I found a Yu-Gi-Oh image at all, I was certainly happy, but it only showed off the card package- Wait. No way! This ridiculous shot of the promo actually shows the previous page which appears to be a preview for Roses. After discovering this, I immediately went over to eBay, where I found plenty of listings to scour through. And this paid off, finding full pages and various other angles, which revealed the page to be a basic promotion for the game, with no indication of the four cards or passwords. However, I now knew which issues to search for, and while images available for issue 38 sadly didn't reveal anything, 39 had promise as it was the first magazine after Rose's release date, but sadly again I couldn't find any Yu-Gi-Oh images at all. By the time I got to 40, I knew this was likely a dead end, that the only chance of seeing anything would be- We found something? This issue, released two weeks after the game, had four full-color pages of information on Roses, and there does seem to be plenty of info here about the game, but nothing that appears to be related to passwords. However, near the title of this section lies a large Part 2, indicating there was more, and while it could be present elsewhere in the book, Part 2 appears to lead the Yu-Gi-Oh chapter, so it seems unlikely which suggests the previous issue had the information. But as you know, I couldn't find anything in what was available. I reached out to sellers, and one of them flipped through the book for us, but was unable to find it either. With that message, the final lead was gone. That's the end of the duel. I used everything I could, and we still don't have an answer for why Konami failed to share Duelist of the Roses passwords, nor where the last four password exclusive cards came from. Along my journey, it seemed possible that these last cards would help give us an explanation to all of this. But in the end, it only seemed to reinforce what may be the most likely answer, a lack of care and popularity for this entry. By 2001, the Yu Gi Oh scene in Japan was booming, firing on all cylinders. The manga was in the beloved Battle City Finals, while the anime was in the midst of Battle City proper. 16 official card game sets had been released, as well as a full 8 video games outside of the Memories series. Fans were enjoying some of the most beloved years of the franchise, especially in terms of the card game, and this more unique spin off may not have garnered the attention it needed for the password mishap to be prevented. In fact, if the available sales data from Japan are anything to go by, Roses was the worst selling Yu Gi Oh game to date, with only 76,248 copies, while both its predecessor and Game Boy games sold over half a million. Even more, the best selling Game Boy Color game sold over 2 million copies by the end of 2001. In the end, this extra layer of complexity the devs introduced by changing the passwords was a critical mistake for a game that would be much more niche. 
Many of these games in Japan had accompanying guides like the one we got for Roses, but none of those contained even the standard OCG passwords to begin with. The password system itself feels intended as a way to connect the physical cards to these games, acting as a type of brand synergy while also offering a bit of inherent marketing. But the moment this was flipped around, things fell apart. When the password system had no connection to the cards, and was simply a mechanic one could use in a game that is a bit lacking in the content department already, both the developers and players simply moved on with their lives. In 2004, when IGN asked, What's the most important thing you think Yu-Gi-Oh! gamers look for in each of your games? The VP of Konami Entertainment Japan and producer of every single Yu-Gi-Oh! game until now, Satoshi Shimomura, said, Well, there are two things. First is the package appearance. We don't put out too many articles and ads when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh! software, so we concentrate on making the packaging really convey the content of each game. And second, when the player gets to play the new game. We want to convey the idea that it can be complicated with combos and other strategic elements. And they certainly succeeded in both of their goals. Information on these games was scarce, and we will likely never have the answers regarding Rose's passwords. But these games and Yu-Gi-Oh! are a beautiful, complicated mess that will continue to be an important part of our lives. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I know this one was very different, but I hope you enjoyed. If you did, subscribing and letting me know what you think about this kind of deep dive investigative video would help a ton as I loved creating it. Making more videos like this on a Pokemon topic or really anything if you have ideas would be a huge dream for sure. Again, you can probably tell how much I enjoyed this and really was able to put myself into it. So yeah, definitely let me know. I need to give extra thanks to my partner for supporting me so much, surprising me with the PC that let me keep making these videos a few months ago, Beatrap for all the time we spent digging into roses, Epics for translations and additional supports in starting the channel, and of course the game's community, especially GMS and Clovis for their efforts to document so much. Definitely go check out their stuff if you're interested in the game. And that's it. The plan is for another Pokemon video in line with my others later this month, but until then, keep your heart in the cards and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.